The Portfolio Composer, Episode 201. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer Podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Hope, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now, for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. The first rule was that when they walked into the pub down the road, carrying a cello, do you know what happens when you walk into a pub with a cello? People say, go on then, give us a tune. Now my challenge then would be, whenever someone says that to you, stop what you're doing, very slowly open the case, get the instrument out, close the case, sit on the case, and play them some bark. Doesn't matter where it is, do it. It sounds terrifying, but the moment you do it, you grow a foot and you won't have to buy another drink all night. But when you do walk out on the stage at Carnegie Hall, that's easy. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Just released, Dorico Pro 2 is a major new version, including features for musicians working in film and TV music and in jazz, rock, and pop. Steinberg have also released Dorico Elements, a new entry-level application that packs all of the essential power of Dorico Pro into a simple, streamlined package that is ideal for those getting started. Find out more later in the show. Welcome to episode 201 of the Portfolio Composer podcast. I am your host, your coach, and your teacher, Garrett Hope. Today's episode features British film, TV, and media composer Philip Shepard. He is an award-winning composer, producer, cellist, fellow at the Royal Academy of Music, and member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. He has composed over 60 film, gaming, TV, and theatrical scores, including Sony PS4's highly acclaimed video game, Detroit Become Human. He collaborated with Odessa on their album, A Moment Apart, which was nominated for two Grammys. Fall from Earth is his second solo orchestral album and was recorded at Abbey Road Studios and released last June. This is a wonderful episode. Philip gives tremendous advice, especially his rules, which I think are rules that you should consider adapting or adopting into your life. And be sure to stick around all the way to the end to hear his stories about composing music for the Olympics, the legal ramifications of that, and who owes him royalty money. All right, enjoy. Yeah, I started playing the cello when I was really young. I had my first lessons when I was about three years old, and I was born into a musical household, I think like yourself, and you know, music was just the social glue in our family. However, when I was born, my brother was already playing a violin and I knew I wanted to play something more violin than a violin. And luckily (laughs) I heard um, a cello on the radio. I heard Jacqueline Dupre playing it, which seems unbelievable, but it was true. And my main criteria for being interested in the cello was if it was bigger than a violin. And it is. So that's why I, <laughs> that's why I played it. And um, I found it quite, I had a really amazing teacher who was actually, she was like, the head, she was the head teacher of uh, a kindergarten. And so she didn't teach me in a conventional way because you know how it goes with often with classical instruments. They're sometimes taught in a way that is from the book and quite dry, particularly in England. You know, we invented boring teaching and um, we did, believe me, Um, I've done some myself. And she had this way of conveying real enthusiasm about playing. She was an amateur cellist herself, but then very quickly she took me to learn with her professor. So from the age of six, I was going into the Royal Academy of Music in London for lessons. And then I kind of stayed on there. I became a student there, then a postgraduate. And then I became a professor when I left and I eventually ran away from the Royal Academy, which I love. But I realised that in composing music, which I was never really allowed to do when I was there, it was really my passion. It gave me a chance really to to run away and join the circus. I had a great deal of luck with the first movie that I worked on. Before we get there, I'm going to interrupt you. Mm. You used an interesting analogy to join the circus and you found that composing was your passion. Yeah. But this educational system that you kind of came up under didn't give you freedom to write. So how did you discover that? I suppose it was my version of teenage rebellion was my teacher saying, you're not allowed to write music. And and literally, it's bad for you. What? Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it was insane. And looking back on it now, I can't believe that that was 
ever a sort of party line, but it was. And it was, I think there was this weird schism that happened when somehow, I think it was the beginning of the 20th century, when suddenly being a performer was separated from being a composer. And let's blame Thomas Edison, because, you know, you suddenly had this thing of the performer as a sort of the cult of the performer rather than the composer through the recording industry. And I think suddenly the star performers were separated from the composition side. When prior to that, a composer would go around and play their own work and a performer would go around composing their own stuff. It was kind of the same job because you had to be an exponent of your own material. Mm. And so there was this ever such a strange system that I found myself landed into where my own cello professor she was studying in 1926, 1927. I mean, talk about generational jumps. And in those days, you really did not cross the fence of being a composer. That was for those old dead white people to do. And we did not do that. And I realised really early on, probably when I was about eight or nine years old, that that was a little bit like being, I don't know, a chef and not really caring how things are grown or being a race car driver and not looking under the hood of the car. And there's a point at which I started to work with musicians who couldn't read music, who weren't trained. And many of them were far better musicians than I am and probably still are. (laughs) (laughs) There's a great lesson in that because I think when you, you know, when you see a musician who's doing it all from heart, soul and ear, sometimes they are way better at generating goosebumps than somebody who, as my friend of mine puts it so eloquently, has swallowed a dictionary. Ah. And I had swallowed a dictionary, but it didn't mean that I could move people necessarily. You know, I was good, but I wasn't great. Yeah. And I think in writing music, you then understand what actually moves people and what dies stone dead. I was lucky as well, because I grew up through contemporary music world, all of the initial groups I was in that were you know, pretty successful. I played with the London Sinfonietta a lot and I had a string quartet that was very successful playing works by living composers, not just old white men. (laughs) And so in a way that was also my best training as a composer because you also learn what audiences do not like and what they do not like is when composers write about themselves. (laughs) Uh, Okay, dig into that again. So you said (laughs) what audiences don't like is when composers write about themselves. Is that what you said? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, what what does that mean? As you know, as a listener of the show, I I think knowing your audience and meeting your audience is really important. Totally. Dig into that for me. Well, for me, the whole point of writing music is to transfer goosebumps into a listener. At least one. Love it. You know, at least one listener. But that doesn't necessarily mean you should write about yourself because that's a crazy path to go down. By which I mean... By all means, write deeply about things that move you and experiences that have changed you. But normally those come from the outside. If, if we write purely about ourselves unmoved by the external world or by people who are better than us, then you are literally painting yourself into a corner. And I've seen many friends of mine do that, and it seems rather dangerous. But it also, certainly in the UK, seems to be the basis of what certainly used to be the classical contemporary music world. It would be composers writing to each other sometimes rather than meritocratically writing it to the people who would be moved. Now, the thing about movie music is that there's a meritocracy to it. Nobody cares who you are unless you really have built up a loyal following. Nobody's going to read a program note telling them how to listen to what they're hearing. Your job as Morricone so beautifully puts it, probably in better Italian than the English I'm going to mangle. He says, you know, the role, I think that's true of all music that for me moves me. It tends to be something that sneaks up on you, doesn't have a label to it, and is honestly there to serve the environment and to move, whether that's through deep melancholy or whether it's through ecstasy, doesn't matter. And I think that's why writing for film It gives you that platform. And it's also brutally honest. If you can't do that, if you can't move people, you won't get another job. It's pretty simple. (laughs) 
Man, isn't that true? If you yeah. don't move people, you're not going to get another job. No. And I think that's true in the concert world too, yeah. right? Oh, gotcha. If I don't move people with the piece I'm writing now, I'm not going to get another commission. That's right. And goosebumps are honest. They are a visceral reaction. And there's something about that that if you have to tell somebody how to listen to your music, you should be writing something else, I think. I do write, I have written concert music, but it's always strange because you feel like, well, I'm now going to be listened to in a different way and judged when actually I'm most comfortable kind of being backline. It's a bit like being in a band. I much prefer being in the second row in a band, uh, even though I'm a complete show pony of the cello, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you but, get all the nice solos. Exactly. But there's a happiness about kind of being, being the frame rather than being the picture. And I think certainly in the documentary world where I've, probably made the bulk of my living your job is actually to present what people are seeing on screen rather than pull attention away to people's ears and you know something i like about that if we tie this back into the analogy you used about eating the dictionary yeah because i think that also describes the schism that you were painting between academic music and music that is concerned about the audience because you end up you, i think you didn't use the phrase writing for ourselves. So yeah. like composers talking just to composers and then you kind of get this music that no one else wants to listen to except for this very small group of people. Yeah, which is fine, but I don't understand why you wouldn't write for everybody. I know not everyone's going to like what one writes and that term academic music, which you're absolutely right to use. I suppose the kind of internal champagne socialist inside me <laughs> really gets wound up by that because it is actually a thing. I mean, I will never, I was about to say, I'll never be played by serious radio stations. That's sort of not quite true. But at the same time, I'm not really too worried about that because if one starts to seek approval from the sort of people with lots of letters after their name, it doesn't necessarily make for particularly honest music. And what I, I suppose the composers that I'm drawn to are the ones who are able to be exceptionally technically brilliant whilst wearing that brilliance very lightly and still giving you a punch to the gut or the brain when you need it. Yeah. And those people do exist. I mean, I think the first composer I worked with, and I've been lucky to work with a lot of the 20th century's most significant composers in some ways as a player. So I remember the first time I worked with John Adams, it's like there's a man with no ego who writes music that is stunningly beautiful, witty, deeply political. You know, it makes people think. And he can sell out the Met as well. But you don't have to read his biography or read the programme note to understand what you're listening to. It draws you in and then it takes you on an amazing ride, quite literally, some of his pieces. Yeah. And then as a student, I worked very closely with Hans Werner Henzer, who I think had the same ability to... You know, even though he came off the back end of the kind of Darmstadt school and fell out, you know, he was vilified by the Nazis for all sorts of reasons and grew out of, you know, post-Nazi Germany as a very cerebral composer, but also could write a tune that would slay you. And Penderecki is the same. All these guys are just incredible in the way that they're able to balance being pragmatic musicians and kind of being smart as well. And there's no shame in that. That's kind of... Good. You know, it's like being the Stephen Colbert of music. I mean, I've always sort of said, eh, when I was thinking about what kind of cellist I'd like to be, it's like when I'm on stage, I'd like to be the Richard Feynman of the cello, if that makes sense. You know, kind of you educate, <laughs> but try and be smart, but don't make that a barrier to other people. Right. I think in our educational systems, though, we still, I mean, there's a place where you have to learn to write all these things and to write in all the isms and to check all the boxes. But I still think there's an overwhelming, especially in our top-tier conservatories and universities, to teach composers to write in this very cerebral style. Yeah, I was just coaching a young woman who lives in London who's finishing her PhD in composition, and part of her struggle is that her teachers wanted her to write in this style, but she didn't want to, and the music of hers that was getting the most success certainly was not cerebral. No. No, and that's fine. You know, that's that. But, but I would argue at the same time, and I think I say this more as a cellist necessarily than a composer, is that if you've got the 
foundations, let's call them the classical foundations. And I don't mean classical era because that's a very limited time frame. I mean, if you've got the technical chops where you can write a fugue or you do understand the principles of, say, a cycle of fifths, you know, that will give people goosebumps. If you've got that stuff and it's ingrained in you, you can then choose to use it or not. Yeah. You know, I mean, th- I think writing a chorale, for instance, is actually a useful thing to be able to do because it's because of the restrictions of its harmonic potential and its very strict structure. It's a bit like learning to write a haiku. Mm-hmm. That restriction will give you a great deal of freedom. Yes. And also it gives you a sort of license later on when someone can't turn around to you and say, yeah, but you don't know what you're doing. And the parallel I'd make is with somebody like, I don't know, Picasso, who, you know, would always famously say that when he was a child, he could draw like Leonardo. And then when he was older, he tried to learn how to paint like a child. (laughs) He had the authority to paint like a child because he could be Leonardo. He just didn't really want to be. My favorite Picassos are at the Barnes Collection in Philadelphia. Oh. Have you ever visited the Barnes Collection? I did when I was nine. I mean, I, no. Okay, so it's been a long time. Yeah. Well, oh, this how dare guy you? went. <laughs> <laughs> he went and he bought all of Picasso's pencil figure sketches. Oh. And these are things that Picasso would throw away. Yeah. And these were what he would do in preparation, even as he's getting ready to paint his cubist art. Yeah. So he would draw these hyper-realistic detailed pencil sketches, and there's a whole wall of them at the barns, and they are mind-blowing because, like you said, he's earned the right. He really could do it. Oh, yeah. It's pure technique. Yeah. And how amazing. I love that thing. It's a bit of a sidebar, but I love the fact that when he went to a restaurant, he would always pay the the check by just drawing a dove and handing it to the restaurateur who very smartly would keep them and never (laughs) never had to work again. Wouldn't that be great? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it would be great. Yeah. (laughs) I've never managed that. (laughs) Uh, Me neither. So you've had this journey of discovering writing music and figuring out how to communicate, give goosebumps. What were some of the things you had to learn along the way to make this career transition happen? Right. Well, swapping from being a professional performer as a cellist and at the same time I was being a professor of cello as well to actually sticking my head above the parapet and saying um, I'm writing music as well it was a journey where the transmission change was violent as in I I had one of those serendipitous encounters where I was I was um, chatting with somebody at a gym and near to where I lived and Another chap overheard and said, oh, I'm in the music business as well. And I said, oh, right, what do you do? And he said, oh, I'm a drummer. Oh, okay, who do you work with? And he said, oh, I'm in a band called The Attractions. I was like, oh, that's Elvis Costello's band. Wow. He said, yeah, I've got a studio around the corner and, you know, there with my family. And if you ever want to record, you know, stop by. That's kind. And at the time I hadn't written any music, so but I went into his studio and went and just multi-tracked and improvised for a bit. And it turned into a thing. I released it and... It started being used by TV companies because it didn't apparently sound like anything else that was out there. But I honestly hadn't written it for anything apart from just curiosity. If I wonder what it would sound like if I multi-tracked, you know, weird cello sounds and stuck some Monteverdi in there. And it suddenly seemed to get some legs to the point when I was then asked to write production music just off the back of that album, which, as I'm sure your listeners know, is library music. It's music you record to a particular theme or or mode, and then it's released out to be synchronized. And I suddenly realized, wow, um, (laughs) people use this. And there are these things called, I mean, I'm so ignorant. There are these things called royalties. And then one particular company were using some tracks of mine to make a scratch track, an attempt track for a movie that they were putting together. None of them had ever made a theatrical film before. And They realized that they were using my tracks primarily through the entire rough cut. And so I got this phone call saying, yeah, we're making this film about the Apollo landings and we've got a load of undeveloped film from NASA and we think it looks quite nice. Do you want to write the music? I said, yeah, uh, yeah, that sounds cool. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, all right. Um, And, you know, there are five of us. We, We put this movie together and the people who commissioned it said, yeah, there's a great movie in here, but this isn't it. Oh, okay. Maybe it's over before it started. Uh. But we persisted and we ignored them and we took it to Sundance and we won. And um, yeah, that was was the start of my film 
writing career. There was a film called In the Shadow of the Moon, and it was really odd. I felt like I learned how to write during the sessions, if that makes sense. I had a symphony orchestra and said, let's spend the entire budget. I don't want to feel, let's spend the entire budget on getting good players and making this sound. Let's make this sound wide. You know, it's going to record it in air studios. I was using um, Danny Elfman's engineer. I just said, you know, whatever you did on Batman, let's do that because it sounded great. <laughs> so I was like, oh, let me show you how good. I yeah. did that. Here's an important lesson. When someone's really good at what they do, if you say to them, how did you do that? They tell you because they're proud. And really good people are really kind. That's Yeah, that's they're just, willing to share. Yes. And it's an amazing lesson in that. So suddenly I had the best engineer in London showing me exactly what he had done to make Batman sound so amazing. And Batman is basically like Marla One of, of the movie soundtrack world, as far as I'm concerned. The first score, it's quite incredible. Anyway, and I realised at that point, oh, there's, there's something in this. I might have a go at this. We took it to Sundance and we had Buzz all. It's great. We had this great moment when they do a Q&A at the end of these movies when quite often it's, you know, there's a tumbleweed moment. And we said, if anyone's got any questions, um, here's Buzz Aldrin. He, he'll answer them. <laughs> do, you, do you know, if you do that, you tend to win the audience vote because Americans get very excited about people who've walked on the moon, I've realised. and um, Oh my goodness, they're heroes. Well, they are. They've actually been to another planet. And in doing that project, I realised, wow, all those years of practice and sitting in a room trying to work out my harmonic sense has resulted me in me, uh, when we did the New York premiere, I was in a room with seven people who had walked on the moon being bought lunch by Walter Cronkite. <laughs> and I rang my dad and I said, dad, you know, you, you always worried about me not having a job. Um, I'm with Walter Cronkite and this is Buzz Aldrin. He said, do you know what? I think you'll be all right. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was my first movie. And it, it was sort of, it was very strange. It was sort of, it all fell together. But the reason that movie happened is that I said yes to the guy who said, hey, do you know what? I've got a studio. I said, well, that's very kind. Yeah, I'll come and just do something. I'll come and make something up. Why not? Oh, wow. But saying yes is terribly important. And I'll give you another analogy for that, which is rather different. That I come from an instrumental world rather than the sort of straight up composing world. And when I was a cello professor at the academy, which I was for many years, I had this rule with my students. They had three things they had to do from week one of studying with me. I think my students were kind of excited and terrified by my rules. But the first rule was that when they walked into the pub down the road, as they inevitably would, because they were students, carrying a cello. Do you know what happens when you walk into a pub with a cello? People look at you? People say, go on then, give us a tune. Now, my challenge then would be, whenever someone says that to you, stop what you're doing, very slowly open the case, get the instrument out, close the case, sit on the case, and play them some bark. Doesn't matter where it is, do it. And it sounds terrifying, but the moment you do it, you grow a foot. The person who asked you, who kind of went, yeah, go on, give us a tune, is sort of embarrassed, and then they're sort of rather... They will go home and tell everybody that that happened. And I promise you, the pub will fall silent and you won't have to buy another drink all night. But it means then you, when you do walk out on the stage at Carnegie Hall, that's easy because people have actually paid money and prepared to be there. If you can play to a pub or a club full of people who actually didn't particularly intend to hear a performance, then you have the right to play to people if you can control that audience. Okay, so rule one is to play Bach in the pub yep. or wherever. Good. What's rule two? Rule two is join a band, form a band. Yeah, and these are you're telling Royal Academy students, right? People yeah. who wanted to be in the orchestra. Yeah, join a band. Yes. What? Why? why? Why not? I mean, because why do we have the God-given right to not actually engage with music that is of the time? You know, and I had this amazing conversation with my. When I went fully to the Royal Academy of Music, I joined a professor there who I love to pieces, who I, who's just incredible, a guy called David Strange, who's still with us and he's wonderful. And But he always kept his other life secret. And I, I met up with him about six months ago and he said, um, yeah, you know, when I was your age at the Royal Academy of Music as a student, I was uh, bunking off, which means to, you know, to play truant, and going and doing recording sessions I said, yeah, yeah, you did the Elgar with Jacqueline Dupre. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, but I was the Rolling Stones' favourite cellist. I went, wait, what? <laughs> you never told me that. He said, let me tell you about the recording of Revolution 9. I went, w w wait, wait, back the truck up. 
Were you playing on Revolution 9? He said, yeah, the Beatles, lovely fellas. That George Martin, great guy. I said, but you never told me this when, you was a, you, when I was a student. He said, yeah, I, I thought it wasn't appropriate. I said, but David, that's what I was doing at night and I didn't tell you. You know, I was off recording with Queens of the Stone Age when I, at night and thinking, oh, this is really shameful. But I knew there was something in it. And we all have this How kind funny. of thing of hiding. And yet, you look at people like High Fitz and Foyerman and you know, all those guys from the great days of the sort of CBS recording orchestras, NBC recording orchestras. That's the equivalent of what they were doing at night as well. Yeah. It's fine. It's great. You know? So was this guy, did, is he the one who played the cello on uh, Eleanor Rigby? No. Now, that was actually a different teacher of mine. I did study with him, I believe. Really? Yeah, that was Derek Simpson, I think. And that, yeah, fantastic. I mean, what a, that, 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 an amazing. Yeah, but those are all guys who, who were professors. Like the, the chap who played the piccolo trumpet on Penny Lane was a professor at the Royal College of Music. I mean, this is the insane thing is that the college's particularly from the professor's point of view, were feeding the session music world in London, which was red hot at that time. But none of these people would list that on their professional development when they had to turn that into their administrators. No, they wouldn't. And I think that's wrong. And I think there's an honesty with saying that actually this is music that genuinely moves people and it's brilliant. I mean... Yeah, I, it's quite weird. I was in Abbey Road on Monday. I do quite a lot of recording there, and the American tourists who are always standing outside graffiti on the wall, you know, please stop doing that, um, were going crazy because it was 39 years ago to the day that the Beatles did the Abbey Road photo, and Sir Paul McCartney was doing a private concert in Abbey Road and decided, hey, he would walk across the crossing as well. It was insane, and I'm kind of thinking, this is my working life. This is crazy. You get to be in these cathedrals of extraordinary achievement. And yet, yes, Abbey Road Studios was the place where Menuhin recorded the Elgar Violin Concerto when he was 14 years old. But it's also the place where Burt Bacharach did his greatest work and the Beatles and everything else. And Pink Floyd. It's just, and, yeah. Yes. But it's just the place that if you practice hard enough, you get to go there and hang out and work. And it's like, wow, what a... So I've gone off on a, on a sidebar. This episode is sponsored by Dorico, the future of scoring. And we want to feature real Dorico users so you can know that real composers out in the world today are using Dorico to make their careers happen. My name is Rode Gustafsson, and I am a publisher with my company Recapo Edition. I was one of the first to buy Dorico. I, w- I was watching the release on YouTube, and I think it was in within a couple of hours I bought Dorico. I have no regrets whatsoever. I bought it and I never looked back. It's my dream program. <laughs> <laughs> I am really a fan of the, the engraved mode and uh, with the master pages and how the, the, the philosophy of music frames and text frames that you can uh, combine both music and text on the setup that you want. And that's a very uh, important feature for uh, for me as a publisher. My workflow has improved a lot. And uh, it sounds nerdy, but it's a joy to work in the program. As soon as you open the program, you say, yes, now I want to create some good music. I think it's a big competitor. There are some features that is not included yet, but I can work 100% of my time in Dorico. And if there is something that I need to do that Dorico doesn't have, I can always do it graphically. I just have to to give my congratulations to the team. I am a part of the the Facebook group. The Dorico has its own um, group. The community around it, it's so such full of love and if i have any question or if, if the, the community ha- has any you just go to facebook and write hi i can can you do this or i i can't really find this feature and almost immediately someone is writing back uh, an answer i would absolutely recommend Dorico to everybody i already do that to my colleagues and fellow musicians and to those who are not sure whether they are the right fits for Dorico. 
I always say, try to download. It's free for one month. Just go ahead, write in some music, and I'm convinced that you won't regret it. It will improve co the quality of your music, if, especially if you're a composer. The output, the raw output, as, as you, when you just put in the music without editing, it looks beautiful right from the start. The kind folks at Dorco have set up a special web page so you can go and download a free 30 day trial copy of Dorico. So go and do that. I am, have been using the program and I'm absolutely in love with it. Go to dorico.com slash TPC. Okay. So let's go yeah. back to your rules. Rule one, play yeah. lock in the pub. Rule two, join a band. Next rule. Now, rule three is the important one. Rule three is a combination of a bucket list and a business plan. Okay. And my dad isn't musical at all. He, the only thing he can play is CDs. Yes, people still do play them. Um, but he was a small business advisor. And he said to me when I was 14, you need to write a business plan. And I was like, my dad, I'm an artist. You know, I'm not down. I, I, that seems distasteful. He said, what's your USP? I was like, I don't know what you mean. Unique selling ah, point. Yes. Right? You USP. know what that is, right? Why I do. You, yeah. Why are you different? I said, well, I'm... I, well, I'm not. He said, well, you need to be. Otherwise, how will, why do you have any right, you know, to do what you, what you're trying to do? Oh gosh, that's interesting. Okay. So I learned very young to write things like a SWOT analysis workout. You know, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What are my opportunities and threats? All that kind of stuff. So I had this idea of actually, I think a business plan can also be a bucket list. It can also be something where if I put the craziest thing imaginable on there, there's a chance that in striving for that, I'll get some degree up that ladder and that'll make me kind of technically or musically or personally better. So I wrote quite a long bucket list. And the first thing on there um, was play at Glastonbury, which is the equivalent, I suppose, of Coachella, but in the UK. And I'm a classical musician, there's no chance. And I was working with a band, a young Irish band, who were being produced by Tears for Fears, who, you know, Great. And I was in a studio with them and I was just writing string arrangements and working with them. And I found myself, because I'd written this down, I found myself saying to them, I'd love to play at Glastonbury. It's kind of one of my bucket list things. And we all laughed. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, wouldn't we all? Two weeks later, the phone goes and they said, you know, um, you were talking about playing at Glastonbury. I said, yes. They said, well, we're playing the main stage. We're supporting Kasabian. Why don't you come and play with us? Two weeks later, ah. after I'd written it down. Now, the reason it happened in that case was because I'd written it down and I thought it was funny. So I told five or six people. It's a very short step to making things happen if you do that. So what I did with my students who I was teaching at the time, is I said, you've got to write down your craziest ambition. So one of them who, she's an amazing cello player. I mean, one of those ones who she comes in and you think, okay, this is year one and you're already kind of, I'm feeling the heat on the back of my ankles from you. You're, you're really quite incredible. I said, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years time? What's your, what's your big ambition? She said, well, I'd like to be, I'd like to be in a major orchestra. I said, okay, that's, doesn't sound very ambitious. That's great. I said, just re-up that, you know. She said, okay, I'd like to lead the cellos in a major British orchestra. I said, okay, that's, that's good. What's your favourite orchestra in the world? She said, well, the Berlin Philharmonic. I said, would you like to rephrase your 10-year statement? She said, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to be the leader of the cellos in the Berlin Philharmonic. And then we, yeah, she laughed. I said, well, write it down. She said, okay. I said, now, when you've written that down, what's the half step, do we think, to being the leader of the cellos in the Berlin Philharmonic? Because they don't know who you are. She said, well, I, I suppose the half step would be maybe to audition for them. I said, okay, fine. But how do you get to audition for them? She said, well, maybe I need to learn that style of playing. I said, great. How do we learn that style of playing? Oh, maybe you go to the Berlin Academy and maybe you study with at least four or five of the people who've been through that orchestra. Oh, okay. So that's maybe a mid to long-term goal. So what are we going to do next year? Okay, well, next year I'm going to go on a summer course. Great. Okay, so what are we going to do next week? She said, oh, what, what do you mean? I said, okay, look, what are you going to do tomorrow about your ambition? She said, well, I, maybe I should write for a trial lesson to the cellist who's co-principal cello. And Okay, do it. Do you know what? A year after she graduated, she joined the Berlin Philharmonic. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> right? But do you know why? It's because of half steps. It's because of going, okay, where's the craziness? Where's the long craziness? And if you keep halving it, you know what you're meant to do actually in one hour's time. 
yes, there needs to be an audacity in our goals totally. that, that, that scares us a little bit, but like we can still do it. Yeah. And as a result, I do that every day. I have every 30, it's weird. There's a reason for it, but there's every 13 weeks, I have an overwhelming ambition and two subsidiary ambitions. And I finished my bucket list three years ago, which was terrifying. So I wrote another one. I did every single thing on it. And these are crazy things. I mean, they're nuts. They are get your music featured by Star Wars. They are have your music played in space. They are some of them with personal goals, like write a book, run a marathon, all things that were totally and utterly impossible. And I did every single one of them because I then would tell people, I would say, you know, oh, I've got this stupid idea. I, you know, want to try and write a book. And, oh, well, we know someone who needs something written about this. And bang, 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 bang. These things all then happen. Okay. So that that's interesting. You said that is the most important part, the act of writing it down and making it concrete, or is it the kind of public accountability part of telling somebody else, this is what I want to do. You can only be publicly accountable if you've created a manifesto for yourself where you're in writing it down, you've created a contract for yourself. So you have to write it down first. Yeah. Because if you don't, it's just a thought. It's not actually, and in taking the time to write it in pen or pencil, not at a computer, but the time it takes you to write it down, your synapses will be firing in such a way that they will creating, be creating links and opportunities that you have no idea about. Now, really, you could say if you've done all your bucket list, that's pure luck. And to paraphrase someone much smarter than me, what's luck? Luck is very simple. Luck is preparation meeting opportunity. Yes. But you can rig preparation and you can also fix the house and opportunity. Absolutely. Right. So how would you rig preparation? How would you do that? Are you asking me? I am asking you. Absolutely, you're a composer. How do you rig the preparation? Well, I think the first part is continuing to hone my skills. Yeah. Being able to write the music I want to write. Yeah. And then rigging opportunity would be developing relationships with people. So networking. Perfect. Which a lot of your podcasts have been about is the value of interpersonal above promotion or biographies and things like that. Those yep. mean nothing. So you're totally right. From a pre- I, Before you can carry on though, I want yeah. to add another one though that's really important is the personal and mindset development that has to come along with that. Oh God, yeah. Because I know a lot of composers who are can write better than I do, but they don't believe they're worth snot, right? Oh yeah. And they don't have the courage or the ability to put themselves out there because they're afraid. Right. So there's that extra step. But being afraid is actually pride. It can be. Yeah. For me, it was. It was It was this thing of, I. and players have this all the time. It's where stage fright comes from. It's, And I came from a very dark aspect of that in as much as when I was 14 or 15, even when I was playing at the academy, my former professor would be sitting in a public audience marking X's over my music oh my for when I made a mistake to the extent that one occasion the audience were asked to stay in their seats while I played it again correctly. Now, that should have trashed me. But I realized that actually the key to not going mad and being happy was actually to kind of not care if it went wrong. And I think actually Ben Zander, who I think has a, his, his Art of Possibility book is very interesting for one yeah. particular, you know, that the main point is his, when, when you screw something up, rather than feeling like it's a sin or that, or it's wrong, is to look at yourself and say, well, that was interesting. <laughs> I want. I wonder why that happened. And that's purely down to preparation. The reason that my preparation was good when I was a student is that I would actually get up two hours before anybody else I knew. My grandfather and my father both worked in fish markets when they were younger. And in fact, my grandfather was still working in a fish market pretty much before he died. And you get up at 3.30 in the morning. I would get up not that early, but I would get up at five o'clock because if I got into the academy when it opened, I would never have a problem getting a practice room. I would never have a problem actually getting in a really good amount of pure technical work before other people had even brushed their teeth. That gave me an edge. And it also meant I learned how to not sleep. And if you want to be a composer, you have to learn how to not sleep. You have to learn how to micro nap. Mm -hmm. You learn how how to, you know, get to the point when you've done 20,000 hours, not 10,000 hours, which is really, really important. Yeah. But coming back to that point of your colleagues and friends who maybe don't put themselves out there despite being great... There's an imposter syndrome. Yes. There's this thing of someone's going to know that I don't know what I'm doing. I promise you, everybody feels like that. I agree 100%. And it's fine. And and 
I'll tell you a crazy story about that. I was conducting probably my, I don't know, my 30th movie score, still not calling myself a composer, calling myself a cellist who wrote music. <laughs> That's an insurance policy. Um, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> standing in Studio 2 at Abbey Road, you know, the Beatles studio, with a lovely orchestra, conducting a movie that was going to go to Sundance. You know, it was going fine. And I realised that somebody was standing behind me. I was on the podium, you know, conducting around. I thought, That's quite rude. You, know, you, don't, you don't really do that in a session. It's, you know, time is money and everything. But I still was standing there thinking, gosh, this is kind of... And I, part of me was feeling, well, they might, they might be criticising the way I'm conducting because I'm not a conductor. I, you know, I turn the pages and wave my hands around. It's not... It felt bad. Finished the cue and I turned around and it's Sir George Martin. Ah, Really? <laughs> Yeah, I looked at him and he looked at me and I thought, oh God, oh God. And he said, oh no, carry on. It's really quite lovely. I thought, well, if he doesn't know I'm crap, maybe I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that was my transformative moment was George Martin saying, oh, it's quite lovely. <laughs> I was like, wow, if I can get away with it in front of him, I'm all right. Now, there is a, coming back to the business plan and the manifesto, the, bu- the bucket list thing. I went and did a talk in January at the Royal Academy of Music. I, they let me back in there very occasionally. And funny enough, whenever I go back in there, I either talk about being a composer, which they banned me from studying, or the music business, which when I was there did not exist. Right. As in, we did not talk about it. So I was giving a talk to about 200 students, most of them postgraduates or undergraduates who are about to leave into the big wide world. And I said, right, show of hands. How many of you consider yourself to be a small business? Two people put their hands up. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's my main thesis. Yes. And I mean, I used a very Anglo-Saxon expletive over the microphone. And basically (laughs) it was, okay, let's have a come to Jesus conversation. Because I just want all of you tomorrow to go down the road, walk a mile down the road to the British Library, where there's a public gallery which has things like the Magna Carta and the Beatles lyrics in it. It's also got a contract drawn up by Joseph Haydn for his stay in London that's a business contract about how much he's going to be paid for all the things he's going to write or not write when he's in London. Yes. And it's a business contract. Yes. And yet we look at Haydn and think, touched by God. Yes, he was, because he'd sorted his business out. Yeah, or that Bach didn't negotiate his (gasps) fees. Or I know. heaven forbid, all those people were running businesses. Of course they were. Beethoven were the same. I mean, that's yes. why he, you know, Beethoven would stage a large symphony when he was short of cash. It's and that's fine. That's and but there was a meritocracy. If they wrote something good, they would get paid. They weren't relying on grants. They weren't okay. Haydn had you know patronage with the Esterhazys, but that made him a slave. I mean, that's why he kind of ran away and didn't, you know, he left the circus because of that reason. But they were all self-contained small businesses, self-invoicing small businesses. If it's good enough for Haydn, I think it's good enough for a third-year classical composer. (laughs) Yes. Right? Uh Uh-huh, 100%. End of lecture. (laughs) Okay, okay. You and I are in total agreement on that. And I love, love that you are teaching that to other students too, because people need to realize, it doesn't matter if you're a composer or whatever, If you are operating as a freelancing musician of any type, if you earn income that you have to claim to your government as self-employed income, you are a business. You are. Yeah. And there's no shame in that. And the thing is, if the business is beautifully engineered and sorted out, you can be as artistic and free as you want. Yeah. And you can actually make more money. Yes. And give it to other people. I mean, my attitude about business is the more movies I can score the more recording work I can give my colleagues. Yeah. I'm not interested in money. I'm interested in time banking and giving, you know, being in the studio and being with friends and colleagues and actually making nice stuff that might be a mark in the dirt that stays around for a little bit. That's it. Right. That's it. One of the affirmations that I read to myself on an almost daily basis is that the more wealth I have, the more people I can help. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And this isn't about me hoarding and accruing. No. This is about me actually making a difference in other people's lives. Yeah. One of my, one of my business partners, I have a kitchen cabinet, which is uh, it's an idea stolen from Obama. Um, 
I've worked on a movie about Barack Obama a couple of years ago, and he has this, he doesn't have a board of advisors. He has a kitchen cabinet, as in it's kind of people you'd have sitting around the table. Uh, if you've had a drink or nine, you kind of go, what am I going to do about this? People who don't necessarily have a vested interest, but you like them and they like you. And with yeah. one of my advisors who I like very much, I said, you know, what's your ambition in life? He, he doesn't know anything about music at all. I mean, it's kind of great. He said, well, I want to create 10,000 jobs in the UK technology world. Well, that's pretty clear. He said, it's a metric and I'm up to 3,000 so far. He said, but I'll feel happy with myself when I get to 10,000. I thought, well, that's, that's a type of wealth that's really something else. That's a wealth of personality. And that's what I would, I'd love to be like that. I'd love to actually genuinely yeah. to be like that, you know. I like the kitchen cabinet idea too. Mm. I kind of have an informal board of directors, people I reach out to when I need advice, but it's, yeah. that's something maybe you and I should do a whole episode on is just that. I have a Slack, which is my kitchen cabinet. And the funny oh, thing do is, you? yeah, the funny thing is when you ask people, Hey, look, would you give me advice? And I think it's stolen from, I think Kobe Bryant does it, but you know, would you do this for me? And, and I'll, I, you know, there are perks I can say, Hey, when I'm doing a recording, why don't you come along to Abbey Road? Or, you know, here's my new uh, not here's my new album because who wants that? But you know, kind of, I can, you know, there's a, there's a nice thing where actually if you ask people for help, they might want to help. And if I can ever do something back, then that's great. But it's, it's lovely because there's not a real connection to the music industry. So it's more people saying, yeah, I think that's the right thing to do. Or that sounds like a bad life choice, even down to sort of social yeah. questions. You know, what should I do? What's the right moral thing to do at this particular point? Because we're all on our own, really, in this business. Yeah. You know? And that's what's scary. It is. And that's why part of the reason why I'm doing this podcast is to show that, you know, we're all doing the same thing just yeah. in our little week, but we can help each other out. Yeah. Okay. I want to circle back to your rules. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we just did a deep dive into rule three, a bucket list yeah. and a business plan, which was just brilliant. Are there more rules? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, carry on, sir. Okay, quick fire. Um, I really believe in studying outside your area of expertise. So that means maybe attending courses that are nothing to do with music. And if you can then push way beyond that, maybe if you're half interested in something, set yourself a challenge to maybe do a lecture about that thing. So I, I found myself doing a lecture about some Renaissance, a couple of Renaissance paintings at the National Gallery in London. I, I am completely unqualified, apart from the fact I like them and I'd studied them deeply, but I kind of set myself this point of, I'm going to go and do that. I think if you're going to be on stage or if you're going to be pitching, if you're going to be dealing with clients, it's really important to study things like stand-up comedy. Oh, yeah. You know, it's very important to be fit. It's very important as an artist to decide what your niche is. And then become the niche because if you if you own it, then the entire market is yours. There's for me, there's no rivalry in the composition world because actually, if they want me to write something, it's because they want me to write it. I'm, I'm I, I don't yes. I don't pitch because it just feels like well, if it could be someone else, it probably should be someone else. You know. I want to stop you for a second because I'm in a total agreement. But before yeah. you keep going, I want to go back to rule four <laughs> because I, I have an interesting story about that. Oh, cool. Uh, which was study outside your expertise. Yeah. When I was a young man, right out of high school, I had a mentor who told me that one thing that he used to do in college is he'd go to the library and just go to a section of the periodicals that he knew nothing about and just pull a journal off and read. Oh. And so I kind of started developing that habit, right? Wow. You know, like I'm a musician and a history major at university. So yes. now I'm going to start reading something in psychology or education or the sciences, whatever. And the benefit to me is that I became a much more well-rounded person. I can have more interesting conversations with a greater variety of people. I mean, wow. and, and it comes back and informs my artistic endeavor, endeavors too. That's really smart. And there'll be a payoff for that so often. I, I found myself in a, I was in a meeting in Los Angeles recently when it was with a, some very well-known movie executives and they were saying, hey, here's our next nine projects. And I knew to engage in that conversation, it went through Second World War maritime history to, I don't know, the economic stresses of the Weimar Republic through to Somali politics. And even just having one of those that you can hook onto and say, actually, I know about that. And right. let's talk about yep. it. Gets you the gig. Right. Because it builds the connection. Whereas if I say to them, let me tell you everything about F sharp minor. They don't, <laughs> they don't, actually, they don't care. It doesn't matter. Right. Right. That's kind of fun. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you know, and it, yeah. it's weird. I find it with my own team. I like being around people who know stuff that I don't know. And it's kind of healthy being in an environment where you're informed about things that are outside of your circle of normal experience. It's just healthy, you know? Yeah. Oh, that's a wonderful rule, Philip. I love it. But I mean, I do this thing called habit stacking, which I'm sure you've heard of, which is where every day you kind of, particularly as a kind of self run person, there's literally a chart that I make sure I've tried and covered at least 15 things on it every day. Otherwise I haven't fulfilled stuff, but it comes yeah. to that. But reading something randomly off the shelf, my studio is a library and I buy books by the yard simply so I can randomly pull a book off the shelf and read for 10 minutes. Just so I'm doing something else, you know? Oh, when we're done talking, yeah. we'll turn on our cameras and I'll show you because um, my studio opens up into the whole basement because oh, of wow. bigger sound, but you'll just see a whole wall of books. Awesome. And it's great for canceling standing waves, right? Yes, it is. It, it's a great <laughs> diffuser. <laughs> it's practical. I actually set it up that way. Yeah. 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 It's cheaper than acoustic treatment. Okay. Yep. Other okay, rules. Okay. So rule five, own a niche. Rule five, always work with people who are better than you, but try to hide the fact. Right. Okay. Which is part of the imposter thing. But I know if I'm in a room with people who are better than I am, it's going to rub off and I'm going to learn stuff and it's going to pull me up every single time. If you're in an environment where you are the skilled, the most skilled person in your room, in the room, it's bad for everybody. It, you're not going to grow. And also you're going to dilute and you're probably surrounding yourself with people who will tell you what you want to hear. Right. Yep. That's really important. Um, if something is, as a composer, if something is 70% there, you're never going to get it to 100%. Start again. Doesn't matter if it's one hour before the session. Start again. Just is that rule six? Definitely. These are no particular order. These are just things I've been thinking about today. Okay. Uh, be prepared to fire yourself. Don't get fired. Fire yourself. I've, I've walked off two movies where I knew that they actually needed something else. And I do this thing when I take a fee, I put it in escrow. I put it, I isolate it in an account and I don't touch it because it's really strong. I can't tell you how strong it is when you leave a project because maybe the team you're working with are not functioning or maybe they want thrash metal and you're writing Palestrina. Mm. If you, at the same time as graciously saying, let me help you find someone better, if at the same time you return the money, they will remember that. And you will get three jobs as a result of it. You'll often get most of the money back as well, but it's a really strong thing to do. It's very hard to do it, but it's a definitely a strong thing to do. And you show me a top Hollywood composer who hasn't been fired, and I'll show you a liar. Oh, yeah. You have to be fired, and you have to sometimes fire yourself elegantly and brilliantly. Here are some others okay. uh, to do with dealing with those kinds of people. Never relay a problem upwards, by which I mean, if you're having technical, logistical, administrative problems on a movie or on a project, the last thing you want to do is relay it up to the next line of professional. So you don't want to say to a producer, I'm having trouble writing, or I don't really like what I'm being told, or absorb it, find a way to work with it, get over yourself. Just really important, you know? Because all they care about is you writing something great, obviously. And did you bring it in on time? Did you bring it on budget? And were you nice to work with? Did you make their life easier? The only reason you're being engaged on a movie is to make their lives better or easier. If you can do both, great. That's really important, though. Others, this is sort of a PR thing, but be busy even if you're not. So... Be writing, be staging concerts so that you look busy because there's nothing more unattractive to a producer than somebody who says, yeah, I'm totally free at the moment. Oh, yeah, if I ring up my favourite violinist and say you're free tomorrow and she says yes, I think, hmm, that's strange. Sure, but you're, surely you're booked out for the next three years, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, there's, a, there's a reason for that. What else? Oh, here's a good one. If you find yourself being asked to work for no fee, and it happens to all of us, still happens to me, Ask for a time exchange. So if what you're doing will take you two days, ask for two days of that person's time. Interesting. If they won't give it to you, you shouldn't be working with them. They might suddenly decide to pay you because it's easier. I wrote the music for a very, very famous supermodel's wedding. Let's call her Mate Koss. Okay. And... Her people rang me up and said, yeah, there's a budget on this. So, you know, we don't have much cash. We don't have much money. You know, I was being expected to write all the music for the wedding. 
I said, wow, that's, uh, that's, that's an interesting, you know, uh, okay, you've put a cap on the budget and I'm obviously at the bottom of it like you are on a movie as well. I said, well, that's fine because I know she's marrying a famous musician and I need some guitar playing on a movie. So it's going to take me two and a half days. So I'd like two and a half days of his time in return. So can you just uh, absorb that? Fun enough, I got paid my full fee the next day. <laughs> Brilliant. Weird that, isn't it? Okay, so give me a real world example here. Because yep. some people who are just kind of entering into the film scoring world, they're going to be working on micro budget independent films yep. that literally don't have time. But does that mean like you can trade the cinematographer for headshots? Yes. Yes. All and I stuff. did exactly that. I did exactly that. A friend of mine called Nick Knight, who's a really amazing photographer. He, I don't know if you've ever seen, I don't know, most of Bjork's covers... Uh, his. Oh, wow. Good stuff. I worked with him on Alexander McQueen shoots and stuff like that. Now, Nick is, yeah, he's like Vogue's in-house photographer. He's like the top guy. And he was doing some fashion films. We're doing, he's doing some things for Yves Saint Laurent. And he said, I'd like to use some of your music, but because of the way that it was structured, they genuinely didn't have money to commission music. And I found myself saying, well, I, I do need a new publicity photo. <laughs> <laughs> so guess what? I got a Vogue photo shoot in return for writing five minutes of music. I think I did better out of that than he did. <laughs> right. I mean, and do you have the rights to reproduce the image too? Yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness, you really worked out then. Oh yeah, totally. And that's that comes to another thing, which is difficult for startup composers, which is own everything if you can. Own everything. By which I mean very specifically own the recordings, own the rights. And if possible, license to people rather than giving them all the rights. And that's a very hard thing to do. It's a very technical thing. We could do a whole episode just on that. But it's it's difficult. It's difficult to get to that point. But the moment you do, you start to build a library of assets that will live for, I think it's 50 years in the US after your death. It's 75 in the UK. Um, it's things that will actually be good for your family down the road. So. Yeah. And I love how you said assets too, because these yeah, are assets. They are assets. Yep. Here's another rule. I carry a notebook all the time because my, my feeling is if I can, even if it's a shred of something half decent, I can write it down. It's, I carry it around like a seed in my pocket. If it feels like it's going to turn into something good, it actually does feel like a tangible object that might have value one day. Now, the trick is not to sit and scratch your head and think of one great thing a day, but maybe to write 50. And this is another rule is just be in the habit of writing. So, and this is actually stolen from, I think it's actually a Tim Ferriss interview, but the idea of actually drafting ugly, but editing beautifully is really important in, in music. You know, yeah. you can write 50 tunes in a day. As long as you know which 49 to throw away, you'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. That's really important. Have you ever read Stephen King's book on writing? Yes, it's so good. I've got it here. It's amazing. It's Oh my goodness. Amazing. And his idea there of writing with the door closed and then with the door open, yeah. it's it's the similar idea. And it's Hemingway is also sort of did that too, but also there's I think I think Sibelius would do that as well. He would just write. And even if it was terrible, he would just be in the habit of writing and getting pen to paper. And then you look at it and think, "Okay, that sucks. Fine. You know, you can line the hamster cage. It doesn't matter." Actually, that little phrase there has legs. But where people get stuck, particularly in the classical world, is in thinking that everything that they write has to be awesome. Yep. And it doesn't. It doesn't. I learned that lesson in middle school because I took a photography class and I had this fantastic art teacher who then pulled six of us who did really well in that first session and basically gave us private photography lessons for a whole nother year. Wow. And here's the crazy part is the six of us had access to this dark room, unlimited development chemicals, unlimited film and paper. Mm. And we were by ourselves unsupervised in the dark room, which means we just created. That's amazing. And one of the things that she told us and that stayed with me is this is print film era, right? Mm. And we were, you had 36 exposure rolls. And she said, you'll take 36 shots and you'll keep three. Oh. And this has stuck with me. It's like, okay, I now have a better expectation for myself as a composer. I can write 30 minutes of music, but I know maybe only three are gems or whatever, right? That's great. It's not perfect all the time and we can't strive for perfection. 
That's really good. I mean, how wonderful to actually be able to say to somebody, you have a license to dispose of things that aren't perfect. Yep. But also just giving you the license, I suppose, to, to, to just do it, to be strong and wrong. You know, yep. it's like in a session, if I've got a player who comes in very loudly one measure early and everyone laughs, I'm actually going to employ that person again because they were strong in being wrong. Yeah. They're probably not going to go wrong again, but they weren't waiting for anyone else. They weren't being timorous. They weren't being kind of, oh, is it okay to play now? They were like, I'm going to be right here. Yeah. Almost the point when the measure moves and everyone else thinks they're wrong. I love that. Yes. And those are the kind of people you need to, I mean, strong and wrong is something I say in sessions all the time. And I genuinely mean it. In life, it's kind of quite good to be that because you can always course correct. Yep. You know, and I've done projects where, here's a crazy thing, the bigger the project. So I, one of my weirdest projects was I had to re, re-score and rearrange all the national anthems of the world for the Olympic Games which was, there were a lot of them. There were 206 of them. Oh my goodness. And due to a misunderstanding with my not hearing the conversation correctly, I thought I had 15 months to do it. I had three months to do it. What? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's about four a day. But I realised because I was working in amongst the International Olympic Committee and the temporary organisation for the Olympic Games that's set up in each city. So I'd previously worked on the Beijing Olympics as a producer. So I'd already seen the craziness up close. And then got to London where everyone involved in it was really nice, but nobody knows what they're doing. I mean, I mean that in the best possible way because no one's done it before. So in that situation, what you have to do is lead incredibly strongly and say, we're going to do it this way, even if inside your imposter syndrome is turned up to 99%. But if it was, okay, let's design a bus stop. Everyone's done that. That's easy. However, if it's, yeah, let's re-record all these in this way and we're going to do it like this. There's maybe only three other people in the world have done it. So you're kind of okay because you're not going to be compared. And also, if you go wrong, you can say, okay, we're now doing it this way, not that way, because we're going to change direction. <laughs> you just, wow. and you, you know, you steer the ship hard to the right rather than kind of vaguely drifting. And the rule that I learned from this, which is really strange, and I think it's true in Hollywood with respect, is that the bigger the project, the less anybody knows. <laughs> Which creates a vacuum whereby if you can go in there and say, we're going to do it this way. You're not saying this is the right way, but we're going to try it this way. And in fact, my cello professor was great for that. He'd say, you know, one week he'd say, we're going to get the perfect bow change this week. It's going to be seamless. You're not going to hear it. And then the next week he'd come back. Now, you know what I told you last week? He was Irish. It was complete crap. It, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Let's try it this way, which was great because actually it wasn't, I'm not really sure how to do that. It was we're going to do it like this. And then actually I was completely wrong. So we're going to do it like this. That's really good leadership. That is good leadership. And in reading every single business book imaginable, the thing that actually cripples corporations is indecision in leadership. It is not being wrong. It's being unsure. Yes. Right? Decision by committee. Totally, totally, totally. So we, okay, I want to circle back to the Olympics thing here because I have so yeah. many questions. Okay. All right. So was your music... I imagine it would have been played at award ceremonies for the first place medal winner. Yep. Was it also played during like the opening ceremonies when each country processes in? Now, I thought that was how the anthems were used, as does everybody else you'll ever ask about this. They never plays during the team entry. Isn't that crazy? They actually play Europop. They never play the anthems at that point. So... The craziness is, I mean, they were used a little bit in the opening ceremony, more for just when they raised the host's flag. That was it. But the crazy thing is out of the 206 countries that are recorded, probably only 50 of them will ever be heard in an Olympic ceremony. Because Sure, because not everyone wins a medal. No. But then again, you get a kind of renegade country who will suddenly come through and win one out of nowhere. So you have to have it. (laughs) Oh, believe me, you have to have it. Yeah. Here's the really crazy thing. A lot of your audience will know, your listeners will know about dealing with clients, will know with dealing with executives, dealing with producers or directors or concert masters or commissioning societies or whatever. (laughs) In in not reading my contract carefully for the Olympics, what I didn't realise was that I was accountable to liaise with every single head of state in the world and their teams in order to get sign off for 25 years for every single anthem to be used in perpetuity. What? Which meant that I was communicating with mm, North Korea, Somalia, Kenya, Libya. 
But you weren't actually speaking with the heads of state, their representatives? Yeah, I was speaking with their representatives and meeting them person to person in certain cases. Oh my goodness. It was insane. So when someone says, oh, this executive is a bit difficult to deal with, you think, I've dealt with North Korea. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be all right. I'll tell you something funny about that. So I, was, I sent off all the anthems for approval in short score form, you know, kind of short version. And mine had to be different, significantly different from the normal versions so as to not create a copyright situation. Whole other story. So I sent off, one of them was I sent the North Korean anthem off to Pyongyang. And Kim Jong-il, who is you know, Rocket Man's dad, um, approved it and then died. Now, all of the decisions he made before he, and edicts he made before he died, he then became a god so that everything that he decreed became the word of God. So my anthem being approved, my version being approved meant that it had been approved by God, which meant that now in Pyongyang, Certainly for sporting events, the only version they're allowed to use is mine. Oh, my word. <laughs> but of course, they're not going to pay you a licensing fee for that. Well, they do owe me royalties. and Do they really? Yes. And the crazy thing is, I am sort of half-minded to go and collect them. <laughs> I'd like to see you pull that off. <laughs> well, I haven't actually found travel insurance that will cover me, or anyone who's prepared to go with me. I'm, my, my friends have backed out, which is very, very disappointing. <laughs> Okay, so this wasn't a, a buyout situation from the IOC. Well, no, it's kind of cooler than that. In London, we decided that we'd try and do a green games because we weren't going to beat Beijing, but we can recycle stuff and we can do things that will have less impact on the environment and all that kind of stuff. So most of the opening ceremony, for instance, was staffed by amateur actors. I don't know if people realise this, but every Olympics, the anthems for the Winter Olympics as well, all of the anthems of the world need to be rearranged and re-recorded every single time. That every time? Every time. Unless they are ripped off, which certain countries have done, which I'm not going to say, have actually just played a CD, downloaded them from the internet. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> so yeah, every time they have to be, which is incredibly wasteful. So we came up with a scheme whereby we would fund them from the UK and then we would donate them back to the International Olympic Committee, which is what we did to so be used for the next 25 years. But yeah, I made sure that some of them were under my ownership. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So you own the rights just for your arrangement of certain countries' national anthems that are now using those in all their national sporting events. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The mind boggles. Well, you know, it seemed like a smart idea at the time. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm not saying I successfully collect on them, but it was it was kind of a fun thing to write in, you know. <laughs> well, but, most of those melodies, I would assume, I mean, knowing like the Western countries that yeah. I do know. They're going to be public domain. Yeah, except only one country in Africa is a public domain tune, and that's Egypt. Because all of the others, they've stepped away from you know imperial rule from the UK or France and have become uh. independent within the last 50 years or so. And in fact, whilst I was recording the project, the gap between recording the anthems and them being used, Gaddafi was killed. So we had to go in and find a different Libyan anthem, and we actually had to make a decision and what the Libyan anthem would be. And we actually found one that was quite ancient and beautiful, but it was a treasonous offence in Tripoli to own the sheet music. What? Yeah. It was punishable by death up until the time that Gaddafi died, which meant, I mean, you talk about research and reading around, that's when I, I'm a member of the British Library and I love it. That's when they came into their own. It's like they found, you know, a single piece of sheet music that had this melody on it. And we checked it with some people who were old enough to remember it. And we went in and recorded it with the London Philharmonic Orchestra and then gifted it back to Libya. That was kind of cool. So who paid you for all this work? Um, it was a mixture of, it's a misconception that it comes from public money. It's kind of drawn from a mixture of the host country. And, and I suppose technically it's coming from people like Adidas and Coca-Cola. You know, the people who are the top line sponsors, that money gets used for all of the pre-production for the games so it kind of came from but officially it came from the london organizing committee which is a temporary structure it's called low cog and you know that's how it works it's kind of a it's like a big temporary civil service it wasn't a lot of money and as with most projects that are big i tend to like spending all the money in the studio rather than taking a fee where possible which i know goes against some of the things you talked about on your podcast but there's a point at which sometimes you want to spend the money rather than necessarily taking it you know? well it has to sound right and sometimes oh, yeah. you have to do that Especially in perpetuity, it's not going to have any samples on it. 
you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Philip, this has been a tremendous conversation. Oh, thank you. And I think that maybe we need to schedule a round two or just, you know, go to the pub in London and hang out for a while. Yes, please. And I want to talk about the way that you put your music online because it's great. I love your Polaris piece. I think it's beautiful. Oh, and one of the smart you. things that you do with your music is you have read along scores whilst you're listening to them. I was sitting there in my head playing along the cello part with it, which is very nice. I need to do more of that. People should check that out. It's a beautiful <laughs> piece. Thanks. Thanks. I, You're I, welcome. It means a lot coming from you. All right. Well, before we go, is there one thing? I mean, you gave us 13 rules as I wrote them down. <laughs> yeah. Things to do. But what's the one thing a composer at any stage of life and any interest in any field could do right now? Okay. Uh, I challenge people with this sometimes, which is, are you carrying in your pocket your best, most recent work? If not, why not? So anytime I run into anybody on my key ring, I've got a USB stick, which is my business card, which has my last five albums on it in high resolution. I promise you I've got five movies from doing that because you happen to run into someone and go, oh, well, here you go. Here's my latest stuff. They might end up temping it onto a film. You might get booked. Just put it on a USB stick and make sure you've always got one or two in your bag. That's some good advice. Right. Philip, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a really enjoyable conversation. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much, Garrett. It's great to speak to you. This episode of The Portfolio Composer has been supported by Dorico, the music notation software from Steinberg. Whether you're a composer or arranger, a teacher or student, working in music engraving and publishing, or working in producing music for media such as film, TV, and games, Dorico is the tool for you. Dorico comes in two versions. Dorico Pro for professionals, and Dorico Elements, providing the perfect introduction to the world of scoring. Whichever version you choose, you'll be using software packed full of smart features that produces beautiful results completely automatically, allowing you to get music on the stand more quickly than with any other software. You can bring music into Dorico from your existing software using Music XML or MIDI, and you can try Dorico out completely free of charge for 30 days by downloading a trial version from dorico.com slash TPC. Try it today.